think that was a great way. It's always kind of amazing to have that activity and see in how many different ways it touches how many different pieces and people and bring this all together. Great waffles. Yeah. Oh, and, and waffles. Yeah. Well, waffles. And the proceeds are almost $3,000. <laughs> That's a lot of plants. <laughs> Next week after the service on Sunday, there'll be a barbecue picnic on the lawn inside. Look for more information on the uh, mini message time on And there is lots of other good information in the midweek message. So read it from the beginning to end and uh, check out anything you need on our website. I took your mom. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But last a couple of the last things. Um, um, we want to do a special shout out for Phyllis Holtz. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of you know Phyllis Holtz, and she's been a kind of a regular on Zoom. I don't know if she's there today because she had a slow start. Um, um, but anyway, it was Phyllis's birthday yesterday, uh, which is exciting, but even more exciting that she came and spent it with us at the plant sale. So, so the lovely Christine Miller. Uh, and I'd also like to talk in another thank you to Helen Files who, who made this great power for us uh, today with some lovely pictures. I think that's it. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, so next thing you did landing uh, uh, land knowledge, right? Landing knowledge, that's right. So I would think that as a, because this is this service about science and knowledge and ways of knowing, maybe we should have a an acknowledgement that kind of reflects the knowledge of indigenous people who lived in this landscape over the millennia. Um, and that, that, that's a very specific kind of knowledge that indigenous people have because they have this long lasting relationship with a place. And you can't get better knowing than that. In seven um, generations they work with. Seven generations, that's your cycle. That sounds a little biblical, monstrous, <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, how about something like this? If someone looks green, there, so let's just read it together, or I'll read the first little bit and then we can read that, read that whole print together. Um, we begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional land is the territory of the Kanega Aka, Huron Wendat, Huron Wendat, and Anishinaabe peoples. Today, we remember and honor the history of the Kanega Aka, keeping and sharing knowledge of the land of water. We Thank you. Well, so we were going to do some introductions. Oh, just because, you know, you might not think we have any credibility here. <laughs> Don't think you're going to have to work Hey, hey, I, I read this funny third article on the internet. I think I'm qualified. Qualified, absolutely. But, but we don't really know all that much about each other. But so we can just introduce each other on the basis of that. And, and all I need to know about Christine is that she's an engineer and she, her engineering stuff is about something about blowing things off. <laughs> Yes. yes, my 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 puppet is actually called Pyrogenesis survey as a pyromaniac. So we are we have and we really like temperatures to break things down and start over. Yeah. Now, Eric, on the end of it, whenever it kind of comes up in a spiritual sense in our community here about seeds. He always knows a lot. Yeah. Well, I was sort of the interface between plants and machinery. And so that's that's what I that's what I did for forty years or whatever. It was uh, it was good fun. <laughs> so and Mark, Mark, yeah. So uh, I work at the Yale Innovation. So um, I'm always looking at ways to get cool ideas out of the public domain to try to patent them, to try to get them partners or to start companies. So uh, every day is kind of different. Sure, it's a lot of things. And you get like I know you used to run the RV. I remember going there once. I did it with the deal. I mean, I did work. You didn't buy you. Where I work on it. How about that? Yeah, I was a had a long career as an airy, very academic and being an ecologist. So there's, I don't know, 
whether they get to be any credibility or not. <laughs> anyway, where are we? Just <laughs> the end, they should know something about this, for sure. So, what next? So, what about the spiritual focus? Can you turn up spiritual focus? Um, I think we're pretty unfocused right at the moment, so maybe that's a good idea. Okay, I found something in Gathering Magazine. Let us read it together. Okay. Come, 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 so Michael has some reasons that it seems a bit. So let's just give it a try and then we'll do the third. I don't know if this children. Uh, yeah, children ponder a lot, and sometimes they ask their right? parents, so their parents really keep this really interesting questions, which could lead to uh, spiritual inquiries, scientific inquiries. So ten years ago, I was on a book celebrating my grandson Dickens. Birthday, and we were on Lake St. Louis, and he looked at me and saw the spiral in the water. And he pondered, I am ready to spiral in the water. And at that kind of we think all the sparkles in our lives, they can lead to both scientific and also spiritual uh, wonder. And wouldn't it be great if we could start a new shade um, with that old sense of wonder that children have? I can mean, see things for the first time. We see things over and over sometimes. And you use a bit of that sense. So it's a song about uh, wonder, whether it's scientific or spiritual. To our third, I think that would be a great one for the food. Keeper. 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 Yeah. Yeah, and a great line there, but a sense of wonder, the Elon Cover say it's them to get her name. I mean, I think that's the sense of wonder and curiosity that uh, we. Certainly did for me, and they got people into science right from the start. And curious to be true, I was wondering and being curious. So, uh, good fit in science and spirituality. So, what's next? What do we do next? <laughs> um, yeah, so I think what was going to happen was each of us is going to take a turn, talk about something with a scientific life experience that was inspiring or influence on how we think about spiritual activities. All right, who's going first? Me. All right. Okay. So, um, honestly, a lot of things in my life kind of happen sort of digitally. So, really, I chose science and technology like a really long time ago. There have been a lot of things that turned the wrong way, but really, my dad had a PhD and I thought that was so cool. So, uh, <laughs> that was one of my foundations to becoming a scientist. Um, hey, but I got to graduate school and I really enjoyed doing my own thing. Like, uh, I had my lab, I had my samples, I prepped my experiments every day, I made my little measurements, put my data on a nice old fashioned piece of graph paper and showed my supervisor. And it was beautiful, like it all fit on the curve, and I could come up with a formula that fit my data. And, you know, it always happened some kind of out here, but well, I got my PhD, and my next goal was that I want to go work in R and D, research and development, in an industry. I succeeded. I got a job, and then my lead job was in research on polyethylene production. Well, polyethylene is a uh, substance made of multiple ethylene molecules all linked together, and it's all kinds of you know uncountable number of chains and varying lengths. And like this was completely obvious because it was on a big scale, lots of stuff going on, all kinds of inputs and outputs, and reactions and measurements. And like nothing was controllable at all. Like in what the end was definitely felt from time to time, like it was not controllable. Like uh, you'd say we've got all the same thing behind that side, and then you get a different polyethylene at the end of it. And so repeating an experiment was you know, 50 50, you know, whether you get the same thing. It was a huge shame for me and really life. So that got me thinking really, like working for men, semiconductors in grad school, going to uh, polyethylene, like, kind of living things. Like, every single thing is different. Living organisms, plants, 
animals, all kinds of animals, all of them are human beings. Look at a medical doctor just trying to make sense of two people having completely different symptoms. So, look at these things all have a mind of their own. So, how can you even start to hypothesize a theory that works from one sample to the next? Look at us all here. So in the end, that's what I'm sort of taking away from my personal experience, my career, different roles, like long but like the events of science we can make with all these uncertainties and variables. We're curious, we ask questions, we get how something might work, we test it, and then very clear we start over. So there's a mystery in there. We never will know everything, but we have a reason to try. So uh, I mentioned my dad at the beginning, and he was like a scientist all week and went to church every Sunday. So, well, here I am. The apple didn't fall apart from the tree. <laughs> um, but we embrace the mystery in creation, living beings, inanimate materials, energy, phenomena on Earth and beyond Earth. So I, I would thank God for the gift of discovery. Great. Jim, thank you for saying that. that uh... I mean, curiously, it, we're all doing this independently, and it's, it's interesting because there are themes that kind of bubble up on the uh, and stuff. Because my story is really similar about how my career, my understanding of science, my understanding of, of myself uh, uh, developed over time. But for me, um, science is mostly about questions and asking questions and asking questions and then being careful about the answers that you accept and, and uh, that's the challenging thing with polyethylene is that you're trying to explain what's going on there and it becomes very difficult in these complex uh, systems um but it, it, i have a, 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 a little story which is kind of silent but um about asking questions because i was around 20 um, you know, I, in the year of the university student going into this stuff, I remember that I was a foot passenger on a ferry going from somewhere around Vancouver to Victoria or something, or something like that. And at the, for foot passengers to get off, they also go down to the bottom deck where the, where the car is on. There's a huge door there, and then they would open the door and they'd all walk off before the cars. Um, and so we were all kind of gathered there. It was late at night, it was a little not dark, but it was very dim, and there was all this stuff going on, and there was a mom there. And I was about like a five-year-old kid, and, uh, and the kid was just fired up, um, and I wanted to know everything. Mom, what's that? Mom, what is that? Mom, what's making that noise? Why is it doing that? And, and uh, it was uh, two thoughts came out of that one, which was this kid was very inspiring. But about everything that was going on. And of course, the other half of that was about his mom, who had been putting up with it all day, and I was kind of walking late, and she was really tired in front of him to deal with these questions. So I can see some of you have been there. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the issue is around asking questions. And I started out my science career out there in the mountains in BC, asking real simple questions about plants and soil, what plants we want, what soils, so why would that happen? And then that grew more complicated, uh, questions grew more complicated about how the soil would influence the plant, how the plant would influence the soil, how the nutrient cycle, how the carbon cycle, uh, those kinds of things. We got more complicated questions until we got into much more complicated with nutrients and disturbance and history and climate change and all sorts of things all coming together in those same sort of questions about the plants and soils. Um, so, and, and during that kind of development of my career, science was developing too. And we started to realize that some of the sort of graph paper approaches really weren't sufficient to kind of capture the, the complexity of these systems and so again back to the project. Um, and so that now that we're really understanding we have to deal with these huge systems of interacting parts, um, many, many components, feedbacks and cycles, and the whole thing is, is very complex. And in fact, they've generated a kind of new kind of science, complexity science that uses a bunch of different approaches to to think about these very complex things like the universe or life or maybe even make it all get there. Um, 
but um, um, what we know from this, and we know from our own experience, is that the world we live in is called complex beyond our comprehension. That it's just it's complex enough that we can understand. Uh, we will work on it probably forever. Um, we know this from our own experience. We know this from the science that we've learned. Um, but it is so much that we look for meaning. And systems science tells us that we have to be comfortable with some sort of lack of precision and this uncertainty about what the answer is. And there's uh, that says something about science, and it also probably says something about spirituality. There. That's uh, that's a lot to chew on. Thanks for, for uh, providing the opportunity to see. Maybe we break for some music, though. Oh, yeah, but what do we do? Yeah, we just want to do like I was looking through the inbox, you know, and there's like almost nothing about the science and the spirituality. <laughs> Anybody got one? Anybody got one? We can have a suggestion. Well, yeah, we need a bit of a gap between, you know, the scriptures of the, uh, you know, that, that often makes it way into the hymn versus uh, science, like, the kind of came out like later. So, uh, there are many songs we sing about the spirituality, at least. Do you remember? So, something, spirit, something. Spirit, something. How would that go? Spirit, spirit. Oh, oh, we used to think all that. Spirit of life. Okay, let's let's be, let's try spirit of life. Spirit of life. It's pretty short, so we're gonna think twice. Okay, I think it's three that we up on the words up there. Vice um, versa. Michael, take it away. So, science and engineering was all that. As my faith background, I was a 
Catholic, I went to St. Edmunds Dickensfield for elementary school. I was an older server for mass. My parents were very devout, went like every Sunday to church. And even when I was living on my own, I was right in the school of Gill, I went to mass, usually at St. Patrick and Silica, and now I used to see Brian Maloney on occasion. I always saw Brian O'Neill, who was the vice president of the NHL at the time. So, um, so growing up Catholic, like the structure of mass was uh, extremely familiar to me. Even now, I could probably walk into any Catholic church on a Sunday and recite the prayers for the So that's just how it works. But, but over time, I kind of started struggling with these rituals and rules, kind of the sameness of it. And, uh, some of this stuff didn't kind of resonate with me. So I started speaking to my dad about this and saying I was questioning some of the elders of faith, things like it all being infallible, et cetera. So, so my dad was literally the smartest person I had ever met. And he told me, no, that's not how it works. Be Catholic, you gotta take the whole package. So it was the charity in the heart that I wanted or being sent to me. It's a proverbial in for any, in for a time. So that was, was the discussions with my dad. That is work for me because I was taught to question things. But the answer is quite from the reason doctor. So I just moved on obviously in the church that I was being but uh, there were times when the science background and the theological background didn't quite finish. So uh, as I was preparing for the service though I started to think about my scientific training. So my graduate degrees are in the polymer so that actually what I did is you know more common than plastics. I was like 20 years too late for the graduate but I still felt a plastic for where it was at. So um, after I got my PhD, I worked in those again, so I actually started to refer. I was a colleague in product development scientist. So I went out, visited customers, found all those cool things we should be making, came up with kind of the idea, then I went to her and said, you go figure out how to make it. So <laughs> that's what she wanted to do. So, um, and so I, so I worked with Paul once for years and spread those words after. And one thing that really struck me that is entropy, so theory of entropy. So entropy is second law of thermodynamics, and the law says you want to maximize entropy. So the Christine mentioned polymer, the way of many chains, that's what polymer means, it chains. And so what maximum entropy means is those chains want to be in a random state. So at this point, we should spill all our drinks. That's <laughs> it. It's not the board, it's not what's actually recorded. So if, if, when you process these materials, you will order the chains by pushing these to the die or in something, but they'll probably go back to something more random. That's what they want to do. They want to maximize the entry. So my scientific background told me showed me that you need to be comfortable with things that are random, that have no order, as Jim mentioned. So it, it, it's okay not to be able to reconcile, reconcile science and religion because this order randomness is what nature wants in the world. So that, that made a lot of sense to me. So I'm here to tell you to embrace the unknown, to appreciate the stuff that is weird, can't be explained, and let's all maximize the truth. Somehow that leads into error. I don't know that. <laughs> And we don't know anybody that's more a piece of editor coming in. That is the same Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'll have to say that I, I, I didn't have any, any background uh, early on to be uh, in science and engineering. But certainly, and I hadn't really thought about spirituality. I was born in the United Church of Canada. My grandfather was in, in Toronto in 1925. Uh, and it, it, was, it was in the, in, in the genes. So I, I had this perverse idea that uh, atheists might be able to give me some. some <laughs> yeah, some insight into all of this. So I want to welcome my favorite atheists. <laughs> the first one was Stephen Hawking, and I have a very short excerpt out of one of his uh, uh, essays. He says, how can we understand the world in which we find ourselves? How does the universe behave? What is the nature of reality? Where did all this come from? 
Did the universe have a creator? That's strange coming from, from an atheist. Uh, then Albert Einstein, another favorite, very short, pithy little bit of actually uh, it's humor. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. And I like that. Uh, but I, I was more interested in, in someone who would uh, be an atheist and yet uh, deal with a life that is in science. My favorite atheist at Barnum is my great aunt Margaret. Margaret Norris was born in 1877 on a small farm in what is now southwest Ontario, just 29 years after her grandparents had come there in a wave of Irish colonists. She was the only girl with three male siblings. All those siblings were achievers, one a respected farmer, another a principal of a high school in Ottawa, another the principal of a teacher college in North Bay. Unlike most young women at that time and place, Margaret did not marry a local farmer and settle in the rural life. Rather, she hurried through high school, and by 1899, at the age of 22, she had graduated as a medical doctor from a joint program between the University of Toronto and Northwestern University in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Think about it. A female doctor in the 19th century in rural Ontario. She didn't stay there. <laughs> Soon thereafter, she took the post of medical advisor for Lord Kitchener's military administration in Allahabad, India. Remember, this is the British Empire. This is a different world than we live in now. Now, during her stay in India, she set up a program, set up a program for the medical care and better lives for Allahabad's inevitable community of prostitutes who inevitably fall fall an army. She found a hospital for lepers during her and during her day she married Canadian John Patterson, physics professor with the University of Ottawa. But when did she find it? It's fine. <laughs> The, the, uh, before the, the, as a couple, they moved back to Canada and settled in Toronto. A little side note, during the voyage from, from India to Canada, uh, an, un, an unmarried young woman, uh, gave birth on the ship. And you know, young young women who were unmarried and, and had children were not not treated very well at that time in, in the in the world. Uh, the young mother was completely distraught and knew that she was, she faced a really bad life. And uh, my aunt Margaret and her husband uh, adopted the child and went on back to Toronto as a family. She distinguished herself from the battle against the Spanish flu in Canada here and worked on many social causes. So it was no surprise when Margaret enrolled and graduated from the University of Toronto uh, as a lawyer. She practiced family law and eventually became the first female magistrate on the bench of the city of Toronto. She retired after 12 years on the bench of the Toronto Women's Court. Um, and know again that she was in the system of justice for women who found themselves on the wrong side of the law. 
No, I did meet Mark Patterson and Mark, Mark and Norris Patterson. I always, I always met him in Toronto residence a couple of times. She was elderly, obviously. I was kind of young. I remember a woman who, if you start going on about an infinite number, on an infinite set of therapy universes, she would shush and told you that she knew that the universe was scary and serious, and she respected that. But she had done the best she could with what she had. She had looked at the world as, as seen at that time and had made it her business to make it a better place. And she was an atheist. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's my... <laughs> <laughs> All right, the 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 so um, I have been thinking of this song by Peter Mayer called Holy Now. It sort of has a view that it's sending the way from the traditional going to church practice to a bigger view of the world and the universe. I think it might be the themes are developing. So we did it once before, Jim sang it. So maybe you can do this. Okay, let's try. <laughs> Let's try to Find the carpet on the floor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> When I was a boy, Sunday we would go to the church, listening to the minister preach, reading from the Holy Word, consecrate the Holy Spirit. Everyone would feel the power living on a different day. Everything is holy now. Everything, everything, everything. When I was in we went on and about the time for the religious meaning. Make the water a wine. I remember feeling the staff. They didn't know the dumb Japanese kids. Now I can be proud. I can be proud. Everything you need. Thank you. 
This morning I'm starting to see saw a little red bird shining like a bird singing like a stranger and maybe it was the bound of the year. I remember when you church went out. How came that Jesus? Everything is holy now, not alone. And you can go for the last day of the road. Every second day, but I want to do that. The king is holy now. All right. So, uh, Lynn, that you can bring up. Can you hear me? Uh, we're going to go straight into the uh, prayers of the community for today as part of our meditation offering. Thank you to God for all the gifts we received. Thanks for all that we did that. Let us pray. We witness to holy mystery that is holy love. God is created and self-giving, generously moving in all the near and distant corners of the universe. Nothing exists that does not find its source in God. Our first response to God's providence is gratitude. We sing thanksgiving. Finding ourselves in a world of beauty and mystery, of living things, diverse and interdependent, of complex patterns of growth and evolution, of subatomic particles and cosmic swirls, we sing of God the Creator, the Maker and Source of all that is. Each part of creation reveals unique aspects of God the Creator, who is both in creation and beyond it. All parts of creation, animate and inanimate, are related. All creation is good. We sing of the Creator, who made humans to live and move and have their being in God. In and with God, we can direct our lives towards right relationship with each other and with God. We can discover our place as one strand in the web of life. We can grow in wisdom and compassion. Oh God. We are grateful for the many gifts and talents we have received. You have endowed human beings with curiosity, with the ability to question and hypothesize, and with the freedom to use our knowledge as we choose to find answers. Bless those who use their knowledge to solve problems and enhance the lives of all living things on our precious earth. May they know confidence and strength to continue in the face of obstacles and setbacks. Bless those who work for harmony and understanding in our increasingly complex world. May they help us work together for a common vision and goal. We bring our concerns to you, not just our own, but for all who are unwell, unsure, alone, grieving, or experiencing other challenges. May we feel your presence in these difficult moments. We bring our joys to you, celebrations, new adventures, 
discoveries, accomplishments, simple pleasures. May we treasure the gifts of your spirit and share them. And now let us join together in the spirit of the prayer Jesus taught to be on the screen. Good, caring presence within us, around us, in the name of us, who all of us in a sense of mystery and wonder. We let the fullness of goodness be within us and around us. Let us always live in the ways of caring and generosity. May we find we have all we need to meet today without undue anxiety. Overlook our many stupidities and all the stupidities others from the marriage of babies. May we all know that we are stupid. Tonight, that we will reach out to the dead, following with the faith to rise love to the other reality of our community. We celebrate the gifts we have committed. Through the richness of life's possibilities, the balance to be good and the triumphs of the good, through the moments when we can be the glory and wonder of the day. richness, you will come back to So we have a few more things to say, but what's the time? We got a few minutes. We got a few minutes? Okay. <laughs> Two minutes each. Yeah. Oh. You got to come out in two minutes? Oh, I know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay. So what? Why do we show up on a Sunday for worship anyway? Well, well why not? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know of any club where the members have more fun than we had yesterday and sell the plans and eating waffles. <laughs> but seriously, we do address the political issues of the world, uh, the important issues of the world on Sunday morning. Not, not the way the physicists and the scientists or the economists operate and see where, see where they have gotten, you know, like good news from the large Hadron Collider, the Higgs boson exists. That means that we all exist. Hmm. Otherwise, the big bang theory falls apart. So I thought some of the big questions that have been cleared up. Not not as fast apparently we have enough evidence to, to describe we don't solve that and we describe the workings of about 33 percent of the universe. There's still 57 percent dark energy and 30 percent of dark matter to deal with. Hmm, that's a lot of mystery. And, and you have a big bang theory. Uh, here, here's a here's something on it. It only works if there is no before. I can't get my head around this. Uh, 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 no, there's no, no before. Uh, somebody help me. <laughs> well, first thing that was in New York. So, just generally, I was probably going to science and stuff. Uh, I don't even know the club of people I used to work with. On television, I mean, research and you know, going to Calgary. And one of the assigned books a couple of years ago was by Sarah Seeger, who is a Toronto native who now, um, for many years, has been in MIT as an astrophysicist. And um, she has a fascinating autobiography, I recommend it, who uh, like, somehow is finding these esoteric ways of deriving, designing these 
uh, telescopes and filters in the shape of a flower and this sort of thing to find the shadow of the smallest light in the universe, which actually might indicate an exoplanet as what? So it's mind boggling and extreme. On the other hand, at the same time this is happening, her, uh, she had a young family, two kids, and a husband, and the husband had cancer and died. And she was dealing with the biggest questions of the universe and the most simple things of how do I go on? Uh, anyway, but uh, at the end of her book, I will I will spoil it a bit. She does find love again. So, um, uh, anyway, at the end of her book, she does wax very well. So she says, sometimes we think we know what we're going to find. And where we're going to find it, and we don't. Sometimes we know what we need to find, and we think we have the right way to find it. But we still don't know that we will. Sometimes we find what we're looking for most in the world, and we might never understand how or why we did. And sometimes, if we're really lucky, we might find something we didn't even know we needed. I have started to wonder whether that's the best kind of science. The role of revelation is equal parts, unexpected, and essential. The accidental necessity. More satisfying than a question without an answer, and it's more profound than an answer without consequence. There's no greater breakthrough than the answer to a question that we never thought to ask. Is there other life in the universe? That's the question. I've always thought I needed to answer. Maybe I've been wrong all this time. Maybe trying to see the smallest lights in the universe isn't to know who exactly will encounter there. Maybe it doesn't matter what aliens really look like. Maybe our search shouldn't be a bit of fun. Maybe it never was. What does it say there are so many? What does it say about us? It says we're curious, it says we're hopeful, it says we're capable of wonder and wonderful things. I don't think it's an accident that there's a mirror at the heart of every large telescope. If we want to find another Earth, that means we want to find another us. We want to be a light in somebody else's sky. And so long as we keep looking for each other, we will never be alone. <laughs> Um, thank you for that. Pretty much covered. So I'm just going to come and get that a little bit more down to the room. Let's go talk about for a moment. Because this morning, when I was looking at the window, we were having breakfast, so there's a bunch of birds up there, and they were looking super grown. And I thought, because there was no seed in the bird. So, so I went up and, and I kept up some seed in the bird feeders. And when I got there, there was about you know, just a little bit of peanuts in the bottom of the peanut feeder, and there was a red rest of nut ash that was there, and it was very intent on not leaving that peanut that had been working when you get in that bird feeder. So we had about a minute of uh, this little the was here, and the bird was like right there, and we had a bit of a second back and forth. And, and uh, so I told him, just go into the bushes and come back and let's go up. Um, but okay, so science tells me that it was a nut ash, and that with that knowledge of being a nut ash, science tells us a whole lot of stuff about it. It's habitat, the kind of things that we don't know. Um, but it's also a really lovely little, little bird, no question about that. And so, and that encounter was definitely a spark in my day today. Um, so, just to kind of sum up, there's two sides for me, there's two sides to this question. That from my life of questioning and my training in science has lead me to a place that, in fact, there's a lot of church doctrine that I don't agree with. Um, and I get a little antsy and few sometimes with the things that we sing and the things that we read. Um, and it makes some of the church challenge some days. Um, but on the other hand, Christian doctrine has some really great ideas, even some essential ideas. And that the those things really bring a completely different dimension to it. So great ideas like peace and love, joy and hope, or all Christians that I would, and like compassion and forgiveness and like loving our neighbor 
and the sharing in the community. We saw that yesterday at the plant sale, this amazing community stuff. Uh, and like mystery, and like all that we that comes with this set of doctrinal discussions that we have. So, and I don't have any trouble believing in those things whatsoever. So that's part of the reason why you know we keep coming. Um, and my my faith, what I have faith in it is that I hope the faith that I hold is that if we keep focused. On those big ideas, and we work together, supporting each other, the world will be a better place. And maybe even like some people call the kingdom of God. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> I think that, uh, that's a great way to do it. Stop with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you should have a bit of music right now. <laughs> We definitely need to see something. Yeah, we got it. Sam's not insane. And, uh, oh, yeah, we've been talking like this has been pretty wide, pretty wide out of this session. So, okay, how about we're all just going to that would be a good piece. Uh, recognizing that you know, this conversation, I was reading some historical stuff from Stenosa the other day. I know that's part of this activity. And Marie got to be stuff. Uh, unfortunately, she's not here today, but then she's, she fed me a lot of really great stuff. And it was pretty clear to me that if we had had this discussion about 700 years ago, we probably would have been burned as her. <laughs> no question. So, anyway, let's sing. <laughs> Let's reflect on how science permeates our lives. 
whether we see ourselves as scientists or not, let's reflect on how science shows us how we are connected in the community and in the cosmos, and how we might be able to use our science to express our gratitude, compassion, and forgiveness this week. Amen. I thought I would just jump in for a minute. It's not expected. This is not part of their script. What? It's what? Um, you know, we started a few weeks ago talking about making sure that we have an attitude of gratitude. I think our biggest attitude of gratitude today is for this wonderful group up here. But this wonderful group is together. <laughs> We have, a, of course, another song. There's always another song. <laughs> I woke this morning, something inside me told me that this would be my day. I woke the morning, getting Thank you all. I think maybe there's something in the back.